For many people, Australia's European history began with the English navigator James Cook in 1770. But Australia was already well known by many people long before Cook arrived. For over 70,000 years, Indigenous Australians have cared for their country. And during that time, northern coastal communities have traded and interacted with their neighbours in Asia, including the Macassans and the Baojiao Sea Gypsies of Indonesia. 500 years ago, the first Europeans made their way into the Pacific and Indian Oceans, including Dutch sailors like Fleming and Hartog, and English privateers like Tasman and Dampier. But it was not until the 18th century that more organised and systematic voyages of exploration started to occur in the Pacific and to Australia. And while many voyagers were primarily interested in opportunities for trade or colonisation, others had a greater focus on science and discovery. The most notable of these scientific expeditions were the fully state-funded French voyages from the mid-18th to the mid-19th century. Despite the political upheaval in France during this time, these expensive voyages continued to be funded by monarchs, revolutionaries and emperors. Like space exploration in the modern age, these voyages sought to advance French scientific knowledge and promote the prestige of the state, rather than directly seeking any immediate economic gains. For many years, Australia might have been an English colony, but it was France who made the most significant contributions to understanding Australia's unique plants and animals. Daniel Claude and Christelle Mezenu from Flinders University in South Australia have had a long interest in the French history of Australia. My great-great-grandfather was a champagne maker who emigrated from France to Australia in the 1800s, so I've always had an interest in Australia's French history. I grew up in a part of South Australia that was mapped by the Baudin expedition and there is a lot of evidence of French activity in the place names around the coast. When I was studying biology, I was surprised how much foundational work on Australian plants and animals was done by early French scientists. When you look at the museum collections, and marine science in particular, it's clear that these French scientific voyages at the birth of modern biology had a huge impact on the scientific understanding of our fauna and flora. As a writer, I love telling the stories of those early French voyages and trying to get a better understanding of the challenges they faced doing science under such difficult conditions. My latest book is an account of a female scientist on one of the first French voyages of this period, the botanist Jean Barret on the Bougainville voyage. Christelle is from Normandy and arrived in Australia in 2005 for an initial three-year stay. Fifteen years later, she calls Australia home. When she moved to South Australia in 2012 to take up an academic appointment at Flinders University, she noticed an abundance of French location names nearby – Fleurieu Peninsula, Cambrai, Sedan and Verdun. She was surprised to discover that there was even an enthusiastic group of Australians celebrating the historic encounter between Baudin and Flinders in Victor Harbour. Christelle has since been working with me, tracing how Dumont de Ville's accounts of his voyages affected the writing of Jules Verne. This research explores the way historical voyages influence fictional stories and children's literature and provides a useful tool for teaching French language and culture to students. Christelle's studies have created a connection for her between the country she comes from and her life in Australia, and it has also made her travels in the Pacific Islands more meaningful. For all of the French voyages to the Australian region between the mid-18th to the mid-19th century, there were two driving forces 
The first was national pride in discovery, knowledge and exploration. And the second was science and collections. Largely coordinated by scientists at the Museum of Natural History in Paris, based in what was originally known as the Royal Gardens, but is now the Jardin des Plantes. Scientists like Buffon, Cuvier, Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, Lamarck and others all understood the importance of collections from new parts of the world for the burgeoning science of biology. And they used their influence to ensure that scientists played an important role in most of these journeys. All of these voyages were fraught with tensions and dangers. Long sea voyages posed many risks, from storms, from disease and from conflict, as the ships raced to beat their English rivals for glory. Sailors and naturalists alike spent months and years with no contact from home, and many would never return to their homeland again. The ships were crowded with conflicting opinions and ambitions, divided by class and careers. Royalists clashed with Republicans. Naval officers clashed with the scientists. Surgeons fought with naturalists over specimens. And both of them fought off the cook and crew, who saw the plants and animals as dinner. And yet many were also united by their passion for and interest in science and discovery. England and France, despite their rivalry, both paused in their wars and offered welcome assistance for each other to continue this important scientific research. French voyages have left many traces of their exploration along the Australian coast. There are over 400 places named by and after French explorers. And there are many more plants and animals that were first scientifically named and described by scientists on these voyages. But these voyages to Australia, then known as New Holland, began with a near miss off the coast of Queensland at a reef named after Louis Bougainville. Louis Bougainville commanded the first French circumnavigation of the world between 1766 and 1769. But his voyage was a first for other reasons. It was the first voyage to include a professional biologist, Philibert Commasson. Commasson's role as the king's naturalist was considered so important that he was paid more than either of the captains of the two ships, although not quite as much as Bougainville himself. This voyage was remarkable also for being the first circumnavigation of the world by a woman, Cumasson's assistant, Jeanne Barret. Jeanne, who had been Cumasson's housekeeper, came from a peasant family in the Morvan of Burgundy and disguised herself as a man to travel with him. She helped Cumasson, who was often ill, to collect one of the largest natural history collections known at the time. Bougainville's voyage did not land in Australia, arriving off the northern coast of Queensland at almost the same point on the outside of the Great Barrier Reef, where James Cook would leave Australian waters two years later. The night between the 4th and 5th of June, we were standing to westward under our topsails by moonshine, when at 11 o'clock we perceived some breakers and a very low sand back to the south. It was a little sandy isle which hardly rises above the water. It was covered with birds. The next day, there were still more breakers, but no land in sight. We could not see an end of them. The sea broke with great violence on these shoals, and some of the summits of rocks appeared above water from time to time. This last discovery was the voice of God, and we were obedient to it. I gave orders to steer northeast by north, abandoning the scheme of proceeding further westward. This land is nothing else than the eastern coast of New Holland. Indeed, these numerous shoals running out to sea are the signs of a low land. And when I see Dampier abandoning 
in our very latitude, the western coast of this barren region, where he did not so much as find fresh water, I conclude that the eastern coast is not much better. I should willingly believe, as he does, that this land is a cluster of isles, the approach to which is made difficult by a dangerous sea full of shoals and sandbanks. With dwindling provisions for his crew, Bougainville turned north to New Guinea and on to Java. French voyages to the Pacific often occurred in parallel with English ones. The two countries waived their traditional rivalry for the sake of science, granting each other's ships of discovery passports of free passage to keep them safe even during times of war. This also meant they knew of each other's plans, and they often set out to thwart each other's efforts to chart new lands. These French voyagers frequently departed from historically Breton ports and are celebrated in local museums and memorials. Australian plants are grown in Breton botanical gardens today in recognition of these voyages and the specimens they brought back to France. Bougainville's ships had departed from Brest and Rochefort and were captained and crewed largely by Breton sailors. The next two major voyages were also Breton in origin. Marc-Joseph Marion Dufresne was a Breton merchant from Saint-Malo who largely organised his own expedition with the support of the Mauritian intendant, the famed botanical collector Pierre Poivre. The naturalist on board was Robert de Paul de Lamanon, who pioneered the study of fossil animals in the Paris Basin. Dufresne landed on the south coast of Tasmania and claimed the island for France on the 5th of March, 1772. They were the first Europeans to make contact with Tasmanian people and were probably the first Europeans to see a thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, a species which was extinct by the 1930s. Despite Dufresne's peaceful intentions, his interactions with locals ended badly. In Tasmania, an Aboriginal man was killed, while Dufresne himself was killed in New Zealand, probably for violating tapu laws. The expedition returned to Mauritius under the command of Crozet. Just 14 days after Dufresne claimed Tasmania for France, another French voyager claimed the west coast of Australia. Sana Lawan was second in command on the Kerguelen voyage, another Breton expedition tasked with investigating the existence of a large landmass south of the 40th parallel. Separated from Kerguelen's ship at the sub-Antarctic islands now named after him, Sana Lawan continued west on his instructions, waiting for his commander at Shark Bay in Western Australia. They found the land low and sandy, covered in small shrubs and grasses, with animals like lemurs, which were probably hare wallabies. And although they found human footprints, possibly in a dance circle, they did not meet any of the local inhabitants, nor did they find much fresh water. And so, after raising the flag and burying an act of possession in a bottle, they departed for Java, and then back to Mauritius. Saint-Laurent died in Mauritius, and by the time his ship returned to France, Kerguelen's voyage had fallen into disrepute after he claimed that the cold and barren sub-Antarctic islands were a rich and fertile New South France. The voyage was largely forgotten. Despite these setbacks, the French crown was determined to succeed in their voyages of discovery, and in 1785, the lavishly well-equipped La Perouse expedition set out from Brest. 
En route, La Perouse heard that the English had set up a colony in Botany Bay, and so he diverted there, arriving just a few days after the English fleet. La Perouse was pleased to see fellow Europeans, having recently lost several of his crew, including the botanist Lamanon, in an altercation with Samoans. The English, however, were less keen to see their French rivals at such a delicate stage of settlement. Nonetheless, the French remained in Botany Bay collecting natural history specimens and repairing their ships before departing for Tonga. Soon after they left, a violent storm lashed the coast. La Perouse and his ships were never seen again. Lost off the Solomon Islands, where traces of their expedition were eventually recovered in the 1990s. Seed samples of Australian plants have been retrieved from the La Perouse wreck, but the long immersion in salt water has rendered them non-viable. The techniques developed, however, are now used to retrieve other extinct species from historic collections. The English penal colony in Australia was largely established in response to political and civil unrest. France took a different approach to resolving civil unrest, with the French Revolution sweeping away the powers of the monarch and replacing it with the National Convention. Nonetheless, the revolutionaries took the La Perouse expedition just as seriously as had the former king. Concerned by the lack of news, the assembly tasked Entrecasteau, a veteran of voyages to Southeast Asia, with a rescue mission, retracing La Perouse's path in the Pacific. The name Entrecasteau adorns many of the geographical features in Tasmania where the expedition visited. Along with the botanist Labiadier, D'Entrecasteaux was struck with the age and beauty of the Tasmanian forests. It will be difficult to describe my feelings at the sight of this solitary harbour, situated at the extremities of the world, so perfectly enclosed that one feels separated from the rest of the universe. Everything is influenced by the wilderness of the ragged landscape. With each step, one encounters the beauties of unspoiled nature, with signs of decrepitude. Trees reaching a very great height and of a corresponding diameter are devoid of branches along the trunk, but crowned with an everlasting foliage. Some of these trees seem as ancient as the world and are so tightly interlaced that they are impenetrable. They support other trees of equal measurement which fall from old age and nourish the soil with their decaying fragments. Nature, in all its vigour, and at the same time in decline, offers to the imagination something more imposing and picturesque than the sight of this same nature embellished by civilised humans' industry. In wishing to conserve only its beauty, man has managed to destroy its charm and ruin its exclusive character, the one of being always old and always new. Like many of the naturalists on these voyages, Le Biadier was a difficult passenger, frequently complaining about the lack of time and resources devoted to his activities. Other scientists who embarked on this voyage had already left at Tenerife, amidst complaints about the ownership of specimens and their privileges as scientists. D'Entrecasteaux took a dim view of this, considering that science is like the air one breathes, belonging to everyone. Although D'Entrecasteaux supported the scientific research, he also had to consider the safety of his crew and the practical aspects of the ship. The scientists were not always to be trusted with practical maritime matters. They frequently strayed too far, took little account of the weather, and put the sailors and their own lives in danger. D'Entrecasteaux passed close enough to Vanikoro Island to name it Recherche Island. He could not have known that this was the island where La Perouse's ships were wrecked and where survivors might still have been found had they stopped. His own expedition met an untimely end as well, 
after Don Tricasto's death north of New Guinea. The ships and collections were seized by the Dutch. Several members were imprisoned, their loyalties divided between revolutionary and royalist allegiances. Labiadier's collections found their way into English hands, but were eventually, with the intervention of Joseph Banks, restored to Labiadier on the dubious grounds of being private rather than state collections. As one of the few surviving scientists from the voyage, with his collections, Labiadier published one of the earliest monographs on Australian plants, the two-volume Nove Hollandae Plantarum Specimen. He described over 400 new species of plants in Australia, including several state floral emblems. This voyage was also responsible for naming quolls, horseshoe bats and dugongs, while Labiadier recorded invaluable early anthropological data from his observations of the indigenous Australians, Polynesian Islanders and people of Southeast Asia. Labiadier published his own three-volume account, Voyage in Search of La Perouse, eight years before the official account of the voyage was published by Roussel in 1808. Such private publications by civilian savants on the naval expeditions were a significant source of tension between the scientists and the naval authorities, who wanted the science published as atlases in their own official narratives. Despite Labiadier's success, officials at the Natural History Museum were still anxious for further collections. They pushed for a new expedition to Australia, this time employing a commander from the Merchant Navy with a track record in natural history collecting, Nicolas Baudin. Baudin's merchant background collecting for the Austrian king did not please his naval and often aristocratic officers. His pragmatic rather than scientific approach to collecting also clashed with the numerous young civilian savants on board. Despite these problems, Baudin returned the largest collection of Australian material to France of any voyage, swelling both the collections of the museum and also stocking the Empress Josephine's garden at Malmaison with new Australian specimens. Baudin's expertise ensured that many live specimens returned to France, including emus, kangaroos and black swans, many of which were difficult to keep alive on ship. The conflict between exploration and natural history was very apparent on this voyage. Having been alerted to Baudin's plans, the English swiftly sent Flinders to complete the charting of the Australian south coast before their French rivals. The two expeditions met in Encounter Bay in South Australia, Baudin arriving from the east and Flinders from the west. After a slightly tense but amicable meeting, the expeditions continued on their way. Recognition would not go to those who first mapped the coast, but those who published their map first. The two captains met again in Sydney, where one of Baudin's officers, Henri de Freycinet, half-jokingly expressed his irritation at his commander's priorities to Flinders. If we had not been kept so long picking up shells and catching butterflies at Van Diemen's Land, you would not have discovered the South Coast before us. Baudin appears to have been less interested in such rivalry. He was concerned about Flinders' safe return home, worried that he would have trouble if he had cause to stop at Mauritius, then known as Ile de France. The French colony was governed by the irascible General de Caen, whom Baudin had found to be no friend of scientific voyages. Baudin offered Flinders a letter of personal recommendation to the Mauritian governor, but Flinders refused, assuring him that he would not be visiting the colony. Baudin's fears were well founded. Flinders was forced to stop at Mauritius on his way home, on a different ship to the one he had a French passport of free passage for, and he spent seven years imprisoned on the island. <laughs> 
Rodin himself died on the island, his expedition returning home, with the privilege of the first complete published map of Australia falling to Louis de Fresne. The Baudin voyage was fraught with political rumours and intrigue. Despite Baudin getting on very well with the erudite French-speaking Governor King, there remain suspicions about the intentions of the French ships. Was Napoleon planning to establish a colony in some other part of Australia? Fears of French colonial interests fueled by these voyages of discovery seem to have fast-tracked approval for English colonies in both Victoria and later in Western Australia. While the English were fearful of French intentions, Baudin had his own criticisms of the English colonisation of Australia. I now write to you as Mr King, my friend, for whom I shall always have a particular regard. To my way of thinking, I have never been able to conceive that there was a justice or even fairness on the part of Europeans in seizing in the name of their governments a land seen for the first time, when it is inhabited by men who have not always deserved the title of savages or cannibals. It would be infinitely more glorious for your nation, as for mine, to mould for society the inhabitants of its own country, over whom it has rights, rather than wishing to occupy itself with the improvements of those who are very far removed from it, by beginning with seizing the soil which belongs to them and which saw their birth. These remarks are no doubt impolitic, but at least they are reasonable from the facts. Not only have you to reproach yourself with an injustice in having seized their land, but also in having transported onto a soil where the crimes and diseases of Europeans were unknown. Fears of French invasion may have been fueled by the activities of his junior naturalist, Francois Perron, who was keen to curry favour with Napoleon by surveying Sydney's fortifications. Baudin's relationship with Perron was acrimonious and mutually disdainful. The gardener had collected more than 150 different species of plants during his stay ashore and had 68 pots of growing ones. This was work and not wit. I trust that citizens Perron and Lechenot will have composed 60 pages of writing, which for a different reason will be all wit and no work. After Baudin's death, Perron was left in charge of writing up the account of the voyage, along with Louis de Fresnay, and duly excised Baudin's name, and the names of the other scientists who died on the voyage, from the record. But he too died, before being able to complete his scientific work. The specimens were eventually returned to the museum, where the scientists Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire and Desmarais did the bulk of the work on them. This resulted in the naming of several Australian mammal genera, including numbats, water rats, potaroos, bandicoots, tomb bats, koala, feathertail gliders, and many new mammal species. Combined, the scientific contributions of the expedition to botany, marine biology, ornithology, herpetology, and anthropology were extraordinary, as graphically illustrated by the pioneering artwork of Charles Lesseur. Several of the officers from the Baudin expedition would go on to undertake their own journeys back to Australia. The first of these was Louis de Fresnay. Having learnt from the troubles of the Baudin voyage, de Freycinet requested that no civilian scientists be taken on the voyage and that all the scientific work be done by pharmacists or surgeons trained and employed by the Navy instead. The surgeons, Qua and Gema, did excellent work across multiple voyages on the area and their work on the de Freycinet voyage was published in an eight-volume account of their trip around the world. These scientists were just as likely to get themselves in trouble as the earlier ones. Both Qua and Gema managed to get lost while collecting and were only narrowly rescued from dehydration and starvation. De Freycinet did have one unconventional civilian on board, however. His wife, Rose, dressed as a boy and stowed away on board, 
only revealing herself once they felt themselves far enough away from France to avoid the censure of authorities. Rose does not appear in the official account of the voyage. She is even painted out of the image of the French camp at Shark Bay, where she enjoyed eating French oysters from the rocks as fine as any from France. Rose had also been delighted by the new town of Sydney. That wretch of a Louis, who knew the surroundings perfectly, wishing to enjoy my surprise, had not told me that we were in full view of Sydney. Imagine then what was my astonishment this morning to find myself quite close to a town and a town whose houses were built in a European style. It is 18 months since I saw anything of the sort and it was a very great pleasure to me. Rose and Louis were well impressed by the fine standards of the new colony, with magnificent buildings and parks and roads, all built by convict hands. Despite the colony's advances, however, on their first night ashore, Rose and Louis de Freycinet awoke to find that all their silver had been stolen. While some of the French voyages to Australia are well known, others are less familiar. Du Perret served on de Freycinet's voyage and by virtue of his experience was put in charge of the Coquille in favour of another officer, Dumont Duville, who was nonetheless a powerful figure on this voyage. Dumont Duville was something of a polymath, brilliantly talented in languages and science, but irascible and lacking in diplomacy. He shared the scientific work with the ship's pharmacist, René Lesson, who became known as an ornithologist. Lesson and Dumont de Ville travelled into the Blue Mountains together. As a result of their efforts, they brought back thousands of plants and animals to the Museum of Natural History in Paris, many of which were beautifully illustrated in a four-volume atlas. Eosant Bougainville was both the son of the more famous Louis Bougainville and also a veteran of earlier expeditions. He had served as a midshipman on Baudin's voyage and was close to the de Freycinet brothers. Baudin, however, had not been impressed by his midshipman. Bougainville's voyage seems to have had strategic rather than scientific goals. He didn't have any scientific staff on board, and he had to pay local collectors a shilling a bird for specimens. While his task to impress the Emperor Minh Mang of Vietnam did not succeed, he was more successful in Australia. While in Sydney, he charmed the local establishment, participated on a kangaroo hunt, flirted with ladies, and, at least according to his own account, upheld French honour by steadfastly drinking the locals under the table. His most significant legacy, perhaps, is that he arranged the construction of the La Perouse Memorial in Botany Bay, in Sydney. While Bougainville was still completing his journey, Dumont de Ville was lobbying to return to the Pacific under his own command. As Duperre and Lesson had found on their earlier voyage, de Ville was a difficult and sometimes unpleasant companion. But no one could deny his drive and intelligence. He had a particular interest in botany, languages and classics, and developed an interest in ethnography through his Pacific voyages. He was also incredibly stoic and drove his men as hard as he drove himself. He had little interest in appearance, and despite this portrait in formal uniform, he often wore ragged sailing clothes on board. This caused great confusion amongst visiting English officers who mistook him for a common sailor, a misapprehension swiftly corrected by the commander's imperious bearing. Dumont de Ville's voyage returned to the Pacific in the Coquille, now renamed the Australab, in 1830 and 1835. 
The successful team of Kua and Gema took up the scientific work, amassing material to fill several atlases on botany, zoology, entomology and marine biology, including pioneering work into the origin of coral reefs. They named the genus of the Tasmanian Devil and were the first to scientifically describe the quokka, despite this species being one of the first Australian marsupials to be described by Dutch mariners 172 years earlier. With the myth of the Great Southland having finally been dispelled by these voyages of exploration, and the Australasian and Pacific region finally mapped, attention turned south to the last great southern continent, Antarctica. There had been much effort to reach the southern ice, but the fierce circumpolar weather that locks Antarctica in an icy embrace made the South Pole a much greater challenge than the North Pole, but one that Dumont Duville was determined to meet. Dumont Duville was also obsessed with equaling Cook's three voyages to the Pacific for France. Six years after the last journey, Dumont Duville set out again on a voyage to the South Pole in 1837 to 1840. He could not persuade Kwa and Gaimard to join him for another journey, and his new surgeons, Ambron and Jacquinal, felt he drove his men too hard. Nonetheless, they did complete substantial scientific work for the massive 23-volume account Dumont Duville produced for the voyage providing a hefty weight of prestige for the French state. They also landed on Antarctic soil, now named after Dumont Duville's long-suffering wife Adèle, who supported her husband's ambitions despite the great cost to their family. They collected rock samples to prove that the great icy continent was indeed a landmass. It was very nearly 9 p.m when, to our great delight, we landed on the western part of the highest and most westerly of the little islands. I straight away sent one of our sailors to plant the tricolour on this land that no human being before us had either seen or set foot on. Following the ancient and lovingly preserved English custom, we took possession of it in the name of France, as well as of the adjacent coast where the ice had prevented a landing. Our enthusiasm and joy were boundless because we felt we had just added a province to France by this peaceful conquest. If the abuses that have sometimes accompanied this act of taking possession of territory have often caused it to be derided as something worthless and faintly ridiculous, in this case, we believed ourselves to have sufficient lawful right to keep up the ancient usage for our country for we did not dispossess anyone. And as a result, we regarded ourselves as being on French territory. For all Dumont Duville's achievements though, his wife found the cost too great. While he was away, tragedy struck at home. Adele wrote to him. When you receive this letter, you will have finished your work in the ice and you will be able to come home, won't you? It is my only desire. Glory, honor, wealth. I curse you. The price is too high for me. I am to blame for this voyage. I too have caused the death of my son. Why was I ever born, unhappy creature that I am? How beautiful my little Emil was. Come home, I beg you through the prayers of our children in heaven. I do not pray anymore. God has cursed me. The letter in the archives is still stained with tears, although whose tears they are, we cannot be sure. The French voyages of exploration to Australia have left us with a rich cultural and scientific legacy, and far more than just a few place names along the coast. They provided us with an alternative European view of Australia from the perspective that is different from that of conquest and colonisation, but rather shaped by learning and curiosity.
the French voyages leave us with some of the earliest systematic records of our biodiversity, helping with modern conservation efforts and important anthropological records, including language, music, artefacts and oral history. Understanding our shared history reveals a different view of our past and helps us to realise that, just as Australia's colonial past might have been very different but for a few key events in history, our future is not predestined either, but a path of our own making that can lead in many different directions. <laughs>